Yeah, the waiting room will just pop up. Okay. We'll keep an eye on that. Yeah. All right, and we're recording, and so we are good to get started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, today on this webinar, which is part of uh, Rutgers On Farm Food Safety Team grant. That's, we were funded by USDA, USDA NEFA for FISMA outreach to small farms. This is obviously open to anybody who wants to attend, not just for small farms or beginning farmers. Um, and so we were glad that you found us with, uh, somehow you found us with, uh, with advertising that was done for this program. This is the second in a series. We are recording this webinar today and um, in the next week or so, it'll get, the recording will get posted on to our Rutgers NJAES extension YouTube page. Um, we have reached out to Donna Paul Clements, who's our speaker today, uh, to see if she would be willing to talk about sanitizers in a post-harvest setting. This is a topic that has been a consistent need, not just in New Jersey, but um, nationally with growers having a lot of questions about choosing and using sanitizers um, and confusion with information that's available to them. Um, so we're hoping that you'll be able to have some clarification, uh, hopefully validation that what you're doing is right. And if not, uh, guidance that'll help steer you in the right direction. And hopefully you'll learn at least one thing to today. So before I introduce Donna, we would like to do a one question poll. Michael, do you mind putting the poll question up for me? Sure thing. Um, and so what we wanna do is find out where you feel like you stand in terms of your understanding of choosing and using uh, sanitizers in post-harvest. So if you could select either one through five, one being you have the lowest confidence in, in this in, with this information and five being you're really confident in your knowledge about choosing and using sanitizers in the post-harvest scenario. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the same question at the end. So hopefully your, your knowledge will, will increase by, by the end. All right, it looks like we can end the survey. We've got all of them um, responding. All right, thank you for, for answering that question for us. All right, so now I would like to introduce Donna. Donna is part of the Produce Safety Alliance. She's coordinator and the Northeast Region Extension Associate. Wes and I are lucky that we've known Donna since her time at the University of Maryland, which was unfortunately a good number of years ago. Um, and um, Donna has been a great partner uh, for, for educating growers on the East Coast and, and nationally, and somebody that we look to and communicate with a lot. So we're really grateful that Donna was willing to um, present today. Um, so with that, Donna, I'll let you just take it from there. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Meredith, um, and thanks for that great introduction. Um, hey, everybody, I'm very excited to be here. I think uh, working with sanitizers is sort of a pet project of mine, I guess. Uh, and it started, uh, I guess, way back. Meredith mentioned that I used to work with the University of Maryland. And uh, back when I was working very hands-on with growers, um, helping them, you know, select sanitizers, things like that. And um, so it, it Hopefully we've made some strides since, since those days of a lot of people using dollar store bottle bleach. But um, <clears throat> what I'm really here to talk about today is sort of set, kind of set the basis. I'll talk a little bit about why we talk about sanitizers. Why are we using sanitizers in the post-harvest setting? Um, and then we're gonna move into how to select an appropriate sanitizer. And I wanna say that there is a lot of information in this sphere to talk about. Um, and I could very easily, I think, cover a, a one day workshop on the topic. Unfortunately, we only have about an hour and I wanna save a good chunk of time for questions. So I am going to be leaving with you a number of resources. So I'm hoping that you view this, this webinar as a primer, um, kind of a way to show and bring up some of the questions that you might be asking. And then I will be leaving you with a lot of resources. So it's not going to be a um, complete coverage of all the things that you see on the screen right here. 
Um, but we are going to touch a little bit on EPA labeling, how to read through an EPA label, because we, um, we've been seeing a lot of questions about that topic specifically. Talk a little bit about sanitizer chemistry. And I'm not saying like chemistry class, but I'm really saying how do you pick out a appropriate sanitizer for your operation? Maybe it's chlorine based, maybe you're using a proxy acetic acid. Um, I will talk a little bit about management of post harvest sanitation systems. And then uh, lastly, I am going to talk a little bit about the FISMA produce safety rule, um, and then as well as leave you with a resource list at the end. Um, so I do actually, before I move on, I want everybody to take a moment uh, and write in the chat box, if you will, um, where are you in the process of using sanitizers on your farm? So for example, are you currently using sanitizers? Um, are you interested in using a sanitizer? Maybe you want to start thinking about cleaning and sanitizing surfaces, or you just here for more information. Um, and these answers are going to help me sort of figure out where to delve into a little bit more detail in the next, uh, the next 30 minutes or so. Okay, I see somebody's currently using... Um, and I did look like from the poll results, it looked like a lot of people here had very, uh, very wide range of knowledge with sanitizers. Okay, looking for more information. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, one sanita sanitate five to treat surfaces pre and post harvest as well as post harvest water. Excellent. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. Um, and that will help me sort of figure out where to spend a little bit more, a little bit more time on things. Um, but delving right into why are we here? I wanted to, the, the next few slides kind of broadly cover what are sanitizers. Um, and to define a sanitizer, it's a substance that reduces the amount of microorganisms to acceptable level. But what I really want to highlight here is that when we say sanitizers colloquially, really what we mean is the term antimicrobial pesticide. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because we are gonna spend a lot of time talking about EPA labels. And because sanitizers are part of that antimicrobial pesticide or pesticide grouping, they are going to be um, regulated by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, but I also wanted to mention that in this presentation, we're going to be focusing on sanitizers really used for two different purposes, food contact surfaces and fruit and vegetable wash water. And uh, somebody in the chat box already mentioned that you're, they're using one of the sanitizers, which we will talk a little bit about today for both of those surfaces, uh, both of those purposes. And that's great because it is broadly labeled for, for both of those uses. But to set the stage, when we talk about using a sanitizer for food contact surfaces, this is really part of that four-step cleaning and sanitizing process. Um, so when I say food contact surfaces, that's going to be any surface that comes in direct contact with, with uh, your food. So things like harvest knives, bins, tables. If you have a brush washer um, in your operation, that would also be considered part of a food contact surface. So in this illustration here, uh, we have an example of a very small operation using a three, three bin, three section sink, and they're going through that uh, washing and sanitizing process. So they're gonna be using a detergent, um, washing off any of the dirt, rinsing it, and then applying that sanitizer. And in an operation like this, we often see those harvest knives or those harvest tools just soaked in that sanitizer for the appropriate contact time. Um, and the purpose here, again, is going to be sanitizing that surface. So treating a clean surface to reduce or eliminate microorganisms. And the second purpose that we're going to touch on today is using sanitizers in fruit and vegetable wash water. Um, and the reason that we are using a sanitizer in this specific use is to maintain the quality of that post-harvest water. And looking at the picture on the left, we have a pretty large squash, um, a squash dump tank. And I've seen this quite a bit on the East Coast. You'll see it right out, um, not even in a post-harvest packing area, but right, right, right out in the field. Um, and the reason that we would be using a sanitizer in wash water is to minimize cross-contamination from dirty water, contaminated food contact surfaces, 
or say a couple of those squash that were just harvested have deer poop on them, you want you uh, dump them in and having that sanitizer is going to prevent cross contamination or the carryover from contaminated produce into um, the rest of that lot of produce. What I want to highlight here, and we are going to see this on some of the labels that we look at, is that these sanitizers are not intended to wash the product, right? They're not sanitizing the product. We're really using them to treat the water so that cross-contamination is prevented. Um, but I did want to highlight um, the other thing we often talk about in using sanitizers for wash water is reduction of plant pathogens. And um, so not just food safety benefits, but also minimizing those plant pathogens that can impact shelf life and rot. Okay. So now that we established those two major purposes of using sanitizers on your operation, I want to start talking a little bit about how might you select a sanitizer. Um, and I mentioned that although we say sanitizer colloquially, really those fall into the designation of antimicrobial pesticides. Um, and since most of you, I believe, are growers uh, on this webinar, you're probably aware that all pesticides on the farm are regulated by the EPA through the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA. And what this regulation does is it, it's intended to ensure that the product, that your pesticides are going to, um, that the, uh, the use of pesticides on the farm is going to limit risks to humans and the environment. So there are a number of toxicity studies, environmental studies that go into um, developing an EPA label for a product. And sanitizers are very similar. Um, and it's really in following FIFRA, so following this regulation is really the primary reason that we mentioned following an EPA, EPA label is required by law. So the bottom line is when you are using sanitizers, um, they must be registered and contain an EPA number. And I did briefly want to mention here, because I do sometimes get this question, that if you work with food processors or maybe you're a food manufacturer yourself, um, food additives are sort of a different branch of, of sanitizers and food additives are going to be regulated under FDA. So as farmers, this is not something that you really need to worry about. I would focus more on EPA labeling and those EPA registered sanitizers. But I just wanted to mention that because sometimes I work with growers that have more of a food processor experience and they ask about those food additives. Okay, so when we say the label is the law or follow the label, there are a couple of big reasons and we're going to walk through some examples in the next few slides. Um, so in looking at a sanitizer's label, uh, first, always follow and read the label instructions. Um, and again, it is a requirement, uh, it is a federal requirement to use the product only as labeled. And that's for a couple of different uh, purposes. First, you're going to look at what is the labeled use. So is your sanitizer labeled for direct contact with produce? That might be through um, produce wash water. Or is it really only labeled for sanitizing a food contact surface? And then you also want to pay a little bit of attention to the target organism. So this might be E. coli, uh, salmonella, or it might be spoilage organisms like those shelf life organisms or rots. And I'll go through a couple of those examples in the next few slides. The label is also going to do a couple of other things for you. It's going to outline um, the correct concentration to use, so the correct amount of antimicrobial product. Usually this is going to be given in parts per million. Um, sometimes they will do the math for you and say, okay, if you um, add X amount of teaspoons per gallon of water, you will get um, a specific measurement or a specific concentration. But then the label also will often highlight some factors that impact efficacy. Um, and this might be UV light, this might be pH, organic load, um, so how dirty is your water? And, uh, and again, we're going to go through some of those examples in the next few slides. I do want to highlight here a couple of tools available for you, and I'm going to sort of mention some of these tools right at the beginning, and I will then highlight them throughout the talk to kind of show how you might use these in your operation. Or I know there's uh, somebody who mentioned that they're a consultant. 
as you're working with growers, uh, you might find these resources helpful for you as well. The first one I want to highlight is what we call the PSA Sanitizer Excel tool. Um, and this is going to be on the resource list that I drop in the, uh, the chat box toward the end of the talk. But this Excel tool got its start because we were often contacted by growers saying, you know, what? I'm trying to find some kind of sanitizer to use. Um, a lot of growers were using bottled bleach or like dollar store bleach. And what was happening was they would have an auditor or somebody come to do a gap audit and they would have points marked off because they were not using an EPA labeled um, or an EPA approved sanitizer. So that's kind of where this Excel tool got its start and it's sort of grown a little bit from there. Um, we are working on adapting this into a web app or a website. Um, it's not quite there yet to share, but so I'll share with you the Excel tool, which is still um, up to date. But what this Excel tool looks like um, is it, its intent was for extension folks or educators or growers to be able to find a EPA labeled sanitizer tool that met the needs um, that really the purposes they were looking for. So this tool, I'll show you a few screenshots throughout this talk, but um, this tool is broken up into a couple of different columns. The first one that you're looking at here is the main page. Um, and this lists the EPA labeled product name, alternate trade names. Um, and these are all just pulled directly from the EPA's website. Um, and we don't do, we really don't do any, um, any changing of information past the website, I should say, or any edits there, um, because we want this to be directly pulled from the information that is included in the EPA label. And then we have a searchable list of active ingredients. So if you were coming to use this tool and you had an active ingredient in mind, maybe you read about peroxyacetic acid and you're really interested in using a PA, PAA product, um, you could use that active ingredients list and find a, find a um, sanitizer there. We also have a label information section that I'll share with you later. Um, and then we also have product information. And here you can just look up information like um, the quantity you can purchase. Maybe you want a five gallon container instead of a hundred top, hundred gallon tote, um, things like that. So it's really for applying it to your specific operation. So that's one of the tools that I wanted to share with you. Um, and again, we'll go through some additional examples a little bit later. But before I get too far, I want to go back to this topic of EPA labeling and how do you know if your specific product is EPA labeled or is approved by the Environmental Protection Agency? And again, I think the type of product I probably get the most number of questions about is household bleach. So I kind of just wanted to quickly walk through where you can find um, the EPA number on the bottle. So looking at this bottle of Clorox disinfecting bleach, this is just from my local Home Depot. Um, the first thing you can do is look at the actual bottle. In my experience, if a product is EPA labeled and you have access to the physical bottle, that's probably the most direct way to find it. So normally I find things, um, I find the number on the back of the bottle. Um, you can see here, I have it highlighted in orange and it says EPA registration number. Um, and that EPA number is always going to be either a two or a three field number. So this EPA number is 5813-111. Um, you can also look on the manufacturer's website. When I am sent questions from growers saying, okay, I'm using this product, what, I, I can't find the EPA number. Um, often it will be listed somewhere in the labeling. So if you can find um, information on the manufacturer's website or the safety data sheet will often list it. Um, or if you don't have a specific number in mind or specific product in that mind, you could use that PSA sanitizer Excel tool that, tool that I shared with you to at least kind of have some product names to look through. And I will say, if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop questions in the chat box. I'm trying to monitor the chat box as we go, um, just so I can answer questions as they, as they pop into your mind. Okay, so what about finding a sanitizer's EPA label using the EPA number? And I wanna highlight that when you look at a sanitizer, if you purchase something like Sanitate 5.0, I'm gonna use that example because Billy already mentioned it in the chat box, 
Um, if you if you have a bottle of Sanitate 5.0, um, usually when you receive that pesticide or you receive that sanitizer, you will also receive the product labeling with it. So there's the product label that's on the actual bottle, and then there's a specimen label that usually is, accompanies it when you purchase it. Um, if not, you can find that online on the on the manufacturer's website often. And a lot of times that label has all the information that you need. So it's going to have, you know, instructions for use, uh, disposal instructions, PPE, personal protective equipment instructions. Um, but sometimes if you were using a, an EPA approved sanitizer like household bleach or um, other types, their label or their product information does not have a lot of information that you're looking for. Um, so that is a great time that you can use the EPA label to find that type of information, you know, how to mix it, how to dispose of it, and things like that. So I'm going to recommend for the growers that if you are looking for more information on your sanitizer, like those specific uses, um, that's when I would recommend looking up and using the EPA label as a reference. It also can be really nice to have on hand if you have a GAPS audit or a FISMA produce safety rule inspection. I've, I've known both auditors and inspectors to ask kind of further about EPA labeling um, during audits and inspections. For, um, and then, so I will say, if you are looking for the sanitizer's EPA label, there are a couple of different ways that you can find it. The most easy way, in my opinion, is using the National Pesticide Information Retrieval System. I have this link for you on the resource list, uh, so you don't have to write it down. Um, and what you can do is you can pull, let's see, remember we have this EPA number right here on the bottle. Um, so in this case, it's 5813-111. Um, so here we can pull that uh, EPA registration number, put it right into NPERS, and then it will pop up with the name. Um, and then you can click on it and you can pretty easily find the EPA number for this product. So that's one way. Um, the other way is if you know that the sanitizer is on the PSA tool, um, or if you're just looking around for kind of looking for a sanitizer to, uh, to research, you could use this tool. And we have all the hyperlinks to the EPA, um, the EPA labels directly embedded in the tool. So you can click on it. And then again, it diverts through EPA but you can um, then very quickly find the EPA number or the EPA label in that way. Okay. So I did want to walk through um, some of the information that you can find in a sanitizer label. And I chose two, two different sanitizers to, um, to kind of compare their EPA labels. I wanna highlight that using these examples is not me recommending these products to you. I simply chose them because I get a lot of questions about these two products. Um, and I think, I, I know a lot of growers are using um, bleach. So I'll just kind of broadly say household bleach um, of which Clorox disinfecting bleach does fall into. Um, and then Sanidate 5.0 is another product that I hear is used pretty frequently. So a little bit about these two products, Clorox disinfecting bleach, it's also called CLB. So if you look on the EPA label, it's called CLB on the label. Um, it is a sodium hypochlorite. So this one I believe is a, I think it's an 8%. Um, I can't quite see on the label, um, but this is going to be a liquid bleach product. And then Sanidate 5.0 is another liquid product um, and that is a peroxyacetic acid. So really quickly, why do we care about the label? Again, because it is regulated under FIFRA um, and we are seeing questions about EPA approval um, during GAPS audits and FISMA produce safety rule inspections. Um, but what I wanted to highlight here is in both cases, the EPA label says it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to take you through examples of, um, or sections of each of these labels for both Clorox disinfecting bleach and Sanidate 5.0. Um, and the first purpose I wanted to talk a little bit about was using these sanitizers for sanitizing food contact surfaces. 
And the first snippet for Clorox disinfecting bleach, you can see it there. It says sanitization directions for use for sanitizing food contact surfaces. Um, and then the second one under PAA is very similar. It says use as a sanitizer on hard, non-porous surfaces. And then it gives a number of examples here. But at this point, I wanted to stop for a moment and give you all a moment to kind of look through this information. And I'm gonna give you guys about 30 seconds. If you could use the chat box, I'm gonna get, we're gonna do a waterfall chat. So I'm gonna say three, two, one, and then I'm gonna ask you to hit enter um, on your response. So the question I'm asking is, what do you notice here? What, what key information do you see listed here on the label for either Clorox or Sanity? So again, what type of information do you see here on the label? And it could re be really anything that sticks out to you. I should have started a timer, but I'm gonna give you all about 10 more seconds. Okay, so Wes started it. I'm gonna say three, two, one. And if you started a response, you can go ahead and hit enter. Excellent, okay, perfect. Thank you all. Um, so I see amount to use uh, for 150 parts per million. Yes, the Clorox sort of um, did the favor of saying they actually give the amount that you can use. A lot of times labels will just say, mix up 150 parts per million and then and apply it. Um, so some of the labels will say, okay, use two, tea, two teaspoons of this product per gallon to prepare 150 parts per million. Um, others say procedures, the use rate, absolutely. Let stand for X amount of time. Yes, I wanted to highlight this, that a lot of times labels will specify a contact time. And that contact time is really important to follow because it's, um, there's a certain amount of research that goes into developing these, these requirements, right? Um, and we're going to get a little bit into efficacy statements and um, efficacy for killing certain organisms, but you have to follow these instructions if you want to be assured that you are killing, in this case, I think it's salmonella um, and E. coli for the Clorox. I think that's what, what's on the label. You have to make sure you're letting it stand for the appropriate contact time because that's giving it the amount of time for that um, sanitizer to work effectively. Mixing instructions, approved sanitizer, yes, approved surfaces that can sanitize, amount to use, wash surfaces before sanitizer, really great job. So these are the types of things that I wanted to highlight that are in a lot of labels. Um, so I wanna mention, we talk a lot about cleaning and sanitizing. So you have to clean before sanitize. It is nice that both of these labels specify that. So uh, um, for the Sanidate, they say um, remove visible food particulate matter, wash it. Um, it's starting to get cut off, but it talks a little bit about using a, de a detergent and then it says rinse and then you can apply the sanitizer. Um, and I think, and the last thing I wanted to highlight was, I think it's, here we go, hard porous, sorry, hard non-porous surfaces. And this is important as growers to know, most sanitizers on the market, I'm actually gonna say most of them that I'm aware of, when they talk about sanitizing food contact surfaces, they say non-porous surfaces. So these are gonna be things like stainless steel, other types of metal. What is not a non-porous surface is something like wood, uh, sponges, if you have a brush roller or a sponge roller. Um, those These products are technically not labeled for sanitizing, those non-porous surfaces. And the reason it goes is because um, research shows that it's really difficult for a sanitizer to clean those types of surfaces. Okay, great job. The next uh, kind of labeled use I wanted to highlight is for 
sanitizing or um, sorry, for use as a sanitizer in fruit and vegetable wash water. So again, um, we have Clorox disinfecting bleach and Sanidate 5.0. Um, you can see here that for Clorox fruit and vegetable washing, if you were using Clorox, so say you wanted to start using a sanitizer, you decided maybe going with a, a bleach is your easiest option for now. Um, these specific instructions are not actually on the label itself in my, in my experience. So this is an example of when you would want to look up the EPA label for these instructions. There's a couple of things that I wanna highlight here on this slide. Um, and this starts to go into making decisions on the type of sanitizer you wanna use in your operation. So again, this is for fruit and vegetable wash water. Um, if you look at fruit and vegetable washing, let's start off with a Clorox. It says mix a half a teaspoon in one gallon of water to make a sanitizing solution of 25 parts per million. Um, and then in, in contrast, the Sanidate calls for a solution of, um, let's see, of 27 to 96 ppm. So again, these are not directly comparable because the Sanidate is a different active ingredient. It's a peroxyacetic acid. Um, but what I wanna highlight here is that this PAA because this is actually a stronger uh, solution. I don't think it actually lists the amount. There we go. Um, 512 to 1800 parts per million of Sanidate. So you can see that parts per million of Sanidate is much higher than 25 parts per million in the Clorox disinfecting bleach. If I were to pull up a sanitizer label for an agricultural chlorine, something like Agclor, um, and that's something that's specifically used for agriculture um, agriculture. It's not a generic product like Clorox. Um, a lot of those chlorine will be more like 100, 150 parts per million. The reason I'm pointing this out is when you look at the label, think about that sanitizing solution, because if you are allowed to use a higher concentration, something like 100 to 150 parts per million, you're going to get a lot more buffer than if you're using Clorox, you might have to pretty frequently be um, adding more chlorine or changing out that water to make sure you're at 25 parts per million. Um, <clears throat> and then the last thing I wanted to mention about this, uh, these specific labels for fruit and vegetable wash water are look at the contact time. We talked a little bit about contact time. So for the Clorox, it's submerged fruits or vegetables for two minutes um, as compared to the Sanidate which says a minimum solution, a minimum contact time of 45 seconds. So again, thinking about your operation, Sanidate, if you have a flume, you wanna measure that, you know, it's actually sitting in that water for 45 seconds. Um, two minutes is gonna be, over time, it's gonna be a much longer contact time, I think, to work into your operation. So again, it's very much a uh, personal decision or an operational decision when you decide the type of sanitizer to use. But these are some of the things to think about when you are selecting a sanitizer. Um, and then I, the last thing I wanted to point out is that the Clorox has you rinse with water and air dry, whereas a Sanidate, after you have that minimum contact time, you just drain it and you're good to go. You don't have to do an, a last rinse step. Okay. So really the last thing I wanna highlight on these EPA labels are efficacy against target organisms. Um, so the Clorox disinfecting bleach, both of these are for food contact surfaces. Um, that the Clorox, it shows it's for effective for Salmonella and Yersinia. Um, Sanidate 5 is effective against E. coli, Staphylococcus, um, E. coli 0157H7. Um, as well as additional spoilage organisms. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about efficacy against target organisms, but I did want to highlight that here. That's another thing that you will find on the label. Okay, and um, I wanted to quickly mention for anybody who is not familiar with Control F, this is a search function in, in really any PDF or even most websites. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that in working with growers, especially those who are using like a household bleach, you can see here, I have pulled up the Clorox um, disinfecting bleach that we've sort of been using as an example all along. The EPA label is 54 pages. In the beginning, I used to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and look, but then I realized you can use control F. So on your keyboard, 
if you hit control and F and hold them down at the same time, you'll pop up with a search function. Search function. So this is how I, when I'm standing in Home Depot and I'm like, I need a sanitizer that is labeled for washing fruits and vegetables. That's how I can quickly look through the EPA label, even on my phone. Um, so just a really quick highlight that I think that is, is useful to know as you're looking through these really long labels. Okay, and then before I move into talking a little bit more about um, sanitizer selection, I want to mention that there is some other good information on the labels that is really helpful for the operation. So things like personal protective equipment, keep in mind that these are sanitizers. And I know a lot of us have, you know, a bottle of bleach underneath the sink. Probably less of us have a bottle of bleach of or bottle of sanity under the sink unless you're a farm. Um, but they can be very harsh chemicals. Um, they are pesticides. So these do have PPE requirements um, listed right in the label. And that's the same for, for all the sanitizers that I've read through. And then they also kind of specify storage and disposal. Okay, so I wanted to quickly mention before I um, move on to other aspects of selecting a sanitizer, because I do want to leave a good amount of time for questions. Um, I want to mention that the PSA Sanitizer Excel tool, if you're interested in using it, uh, we do have a label information section of it. And that's what I'm showing here on the screen. And you can, I think it makes it a lot easier to navigate through EPA labels because you can search by specific labeled uses. So for example, you're a grower and you want to find a sanitizer that you can use for both fruit and vegetable wash water and food contact surfaces. Um, you can use this tool to kind of navigate through and find a product that might suit your needs. And we also mentioned um, the efficacy statements for, for each of those sanitizers. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to mention, and I'm going to go through these slides, but what I really want you to take home from this webinar is there are a lot of resources available to help you make your decision and help guide sanitizer use in your operation. Um, so I talked a little bit about EPA labeling. I talked a lot about EPA labeling. The next thing when you choose a sanitizer is thinking about what chemistry you want to use. So what type of sanitizer do you want to use? Chlorine sanitizers are very commonly used. I would say I'm seeing PAA products, um, peroxyacetic acid products more and more, even on small farms. They tend to be a little bit more expensive, but a lot of people find them easier to use because they are a little bit less reactive than chlorine. Um, there are organic formulations available for sanitizers. A lot of these organic formulations are proxy acetic acid. Um, but I do want to share with you one of my favorite fact sheets. Uh, this is out of Washington State University, and this is also on the resource list that I'll, I'll share with you um, at the end. Um, and it's called Food Safety Considerations for Post-Harvest Washing of Produce and Sanitation of Packing Areas. What this fact sheet does is it, it pretty much does it all. It talks a little bit about labeling and it really focuses on chlorine products and peroxyacetic acid products. Um, but it, it really goes through management considerations, especially when you're using chlorine. So again, I'm always wary of sharing too much during a one hour webinar. So um, I'm going to very briefly go through some considerations when you're selecting a type of sanitizer, but really I'm recommending that you use this fact sheet as a resource. So over the next couple of slides, I am going to briefly highlight um, two different sanitizer chemistries. There's two different types of san sanitizers. The first one is chlorine. Uh, chlorine sanitizers come in several forms. Sodium hypochlorite, we already talked about. Um, that would be, that's usually called bleach. Uh, a lot of your Clorox products are an example of, of sodium hypochlorite. Then we also have calcium hypochlorite. And I have a picture of the AccuTab system here. Again, not a recommendation. It's just something that I do commonly see on farms. Um, a lot of folks who have pools are familiar with calcium hypochlorite because pool tablets are, are usually um, that chemistry. And then the last one I want to highlight is chlorine dioxide. I don't see chlorine dioxide as much 
Um, I don't see chlorine, chlorine dioxide as much on smaller farms. I tend to see it more out west or on larger farms, um, just because a lot of times a device is needed to generate that chlorine dioxide. However, the product I'm showing here, there are stabilized chlorine dioxide where it's usually like a sachet and you add it to water and then it, it develops the, um, the hypochlorous active acid, which is that active ingredient. Um, but what I want to highlight when you are thinking about using a chlorine sanitizer is there are a number of factors that impact the efficacy because chlorine, I always call it kind of finicky. It's a little reactive. So when you were using chlorine sanitizer, you need to consider the pH of your water. Um, you will need to consider the concentration, but you're going to need to consider the concentration no matter what, what sanitizer type you use. Um, and obviously the requirement there is to follow what the label says. Um, you will need to think about the contact time as well as organic matter in the water in the water temperature. So again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but that fact sheet I referred to has um, really, really good information on each of these factors. But the take home is that when you're using a chlorine sanitizer, you will need to man uh, manage these factors for your sanitizer to be effective. The next one I want to briefly highlight is peroxyacetic acid. Um, I am seeing PAA products used more commonly on farms um, because they do tend to be a little bit less reactive than, um, than chlorine products. So the idea here is that when PAA is dissolved in water, it breaks down into CO2, oxygen, and water. Um, and for that reason, this peroxyacetic acid, this product is often available in organic approved formulations. Um, and I see, I think it's a question in the chat box yeah, so it's either a question or a statement. I'm not sure. But um, I do want to remind you that if you are an organic grower, you do have to make sure the sanitizer you were using is OMRI approved. Um, so I mentioned, and again, this is a check with your uh, certifier before you make any management decisions or operational decisions. Um, there are some of the chlorine products are um, restricted for use, but they are conditionally approved if the, the uh, amount in the water when it's released into the environment is often less than four parts per million, which is the equivalent to drinking water. Um, so again, this is more of a check with your certifier before you make any management decisions. Um, PAA is sometimes more expensive, but a lot of growers I talk to find the ease of use sometimes outweighs the, the expense just because they don't have to um, manage the pH and worry about the organic load as much as they do with, with chlorine products. Um, and I do, again, very quickly want to mention that there are additional products available. These tend to be more, uh, they're called sanitizing or pesticide devices. Um, so UV light is pretty effective, is very effective for treating clear water. Um, this struggles more if you have turbid water or, or um, cloudy water because the UV light has to penetrate through that water for it to be effective. Um, and then ozone devices are another option. They are highly reactive, but one of the benefits is that there's no chemical storage needed. Um, but again, if this is something you are, are looking, if you're interested in, there is more information online, but usually the recommendation here is to contact the specific uh, manufacturer of those devices. Okay, but just a reminder, because I went through that very quickly, um, a lot of this information is on this fact sheet out by uh, Washington State University, and this is one of my go-tos in, in kind of walking through selecting sanitizers. To wrap things up, because I do want to leave time for questions, um, I want to mention a little bit more about sanitizer management. So once you select a sanitizer, you can start incorporating it into your operation. Um, I want to highlight there are a few different ways to monitor the treatment level. My big recommendation is usually to work with the manufacturer of that product. Um, oftentimes, they will sell a way to monitor that, that um, concentration of the sanitizer. So for example, I know that Sanity, uh, or I'm sorry, BioSafe is a manufacturer for Sanity. Um, they sell strips and they also sell titration kits for PAA. 
Uh, you can also buy um, generic titration kits. So when I say a titration kit, that's the picture on the bottom right hand of the screen. So dropping drops, and you have to count the drops. Um, for proxy acetic acid, a titration kit is generally going to be the most accurate, um, more accurate than your strips or, um, or a meter. Um, but there are also your free chlorine strips. So if you are using a chlorine product, you will you want to make sure that you are using a free chlorine strip, not a total chlorine strip. Uh, it's a total chlorine that's often sold at like pole uh, chemical stores. So make sure you're using that right product there. Okay, I want to quickly mention two additional resources that are also on this list I'm going to share with you. Um, the next question is, what, how do I calculate the dose of sanitizer that I need? And I shared with you um, in, the chlor in the Clorox label, it specifically says, okay, if you add X teaspoons to one gallon of water, you're going to get 150 parts per million. A lot of the labels don't do those calculations for you. There is a really nice uh, sanitizer dose calculator on the University of Vermont's website. Chris Callahan has a lot of great sanitizer resources that are very practical. Um, so that's one of the resources I recommend to help you if you're like me and math is not your strong suit, really helps out with those calculations. The other one I wanna mention is the Safely Dispensing Sanitizers um, fact sheet that he's developed. Very small scale, practical means of sanitizer dispensing. Okay, um, and then to wrap things up, I just briefly want to mention a lot of these are highlighted in the resources I'm sharing with you, but when you go about selecting a sanitizer, um, what are some of the considerations? Thinking about A, is it labeled for your needs? Um, what do you need it for? Is it mostly produce washing or is it both produce washing and food contact surfaces? Um, there are a lot fewer sanitizers labeled only for produce washing. Um, ease of use, is it going to require a rinse? We talked a little bit about that in reading through the labels. What is the contact time, um, price, and then quantity? If you're a smaller scale grower, you're probably more interested in like a five gallon container rather than a hundred gallon tub that you need to use within you know a few months. And then I do quickly want to mention uh, standard operating procedures. I have an example of an SOP in the resource list. Uh, but again, think about your specific operation when you're when you're um, deciding on how to use a sanitizer. So the labels provide very basic information. It's really that baseline, what is legally required, but it doesn't provide detail on your specific operation. Um, so for example, thinking about how are you going to measure the concentration? If you're working with a chlorine sanit based sanitizer and you need to adjust the pH, how are you going to do that? Um, how often are you going to change your water? And things like that. So a lot of these are included in the template SOP that I'm showing on the right-hand side of the screen, um, but I have that in the resource list as well if that's something you're interested in. And I'm going to switch gears for a moment um, and really quickly well, mention- Donna, yes. before you do that, there is a question in the chat that goes oh. to using um, any of these sanitizers that you've talked about to deal with algae formation in hydroponic systems? Oh, good question. Um, okay, can you comment on addressing algae formation? So I would have to double check. I Okay, I can say a lot of the sanitizers that I see in sanitizer labels I read are labeled for reducing, I believe it's algae, I would have to double check, and um, slime forming, like iron forming bacteria in irrigation systems. I would have to check the language to see if that would apply because I would expect hydroponic is relatively specific. Um, so what I would do, Thomas, is I would look at the labels in the PSA, this Excel tool, there is a labeled for irrigation systems column. I would probably start there and look at those products, but look on the agricultural side of things. So I would read through that, um, that language because it will specifically say algae in irrigation systems um, or algae in specific systems. So that's what I would do. Um, 
I can also double check because I'm not as familiar with hydroponic and I don't think hydroponic would have specific labeling. Um, so I would really go back to the, the look for algae um, in that target, that target organism. Excellent. So actually, I think this is a good point maybe to stop for questions. And then at the very end, I can kind of share those resources with you. Um, so I stopped sharing screen and I wanna see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, you guys can, can unmute if you'd like to ask one rather than use the chat. I got a question. <laughs> I'll ask a question, Meredith. This Jeff. Awesome! Yay! Uh, any thoughts on materials for wash tubs, like um, galvanized or the poly plastic, um, as far as being better or worse for sanitizing um, purposes? You're gonna want, in terms of surfaces for sanitize something that you're going to have a contact with the sanitizer with, you want something that's not reactive. So I think poly tubs are often used. Um, so you're, the key is really anything that is sanitizable. So obviously not like a wood surface. Um, but let give me one second because there's another, I'm not a material specialist, um, but there is a resource that I can send you to. I don't know if Meredith or Wes or if you guys have any, any input there. Stainless steel is often recommended um, just because it tends to not be reactive. Galvanized, I think, is a little bit more iffy. Um, it can be corroded easily by, by sanitizers. Um, a lot of the poly is pretty inert, but those are usually the considerations I look for. Um, but let me see. I will probably have to follow up. Maybe I can follow up with Meredith and she can send it. Yeah, on. I can get Jeff that. Um, so Chris, Chris Callahan, he's, I mentioned his sanitizer dosing resources. He's an ag engineer and he's been specializing in a lot of small scale, um, sanitizer resources. And I know he has a blog post up about materials kind of talking through that whole discussion. Um, so once I find it, I can, I can follow up with that. Yeah, I can look for that too. Okay. Billy says, can you discuss further the implications of improper mixing? On our farm, we are often inaccurate measuring the wash water, the sanitate. Okay, um, if we add too much or too little, what are the dangers? Great question, Billy. Um, so the it, it kind of comes down to the label. So I'll start with using too little. Obviously, you're going to have less of a buffer um, because what happens is no matter what sanitizer you use over time, um, either from off-gassing or from having organic ma material and that sanitizer will often bind with the organic material, especially if it's like a chlorine based. Um, over time, you're gonna have a reduction in the amount of um, effective product. So if you're using too little, you're gonna have less of a buffer or if you use a lot or very much too little, um, you're not gonna have enough of that effective um, uh, chemical that's treating microorganisms. If you have too much, you run in danger of, of using, not following the label. So for that reason, I usually recommend sticking to the middle of the range. So if you look at the instructions or the labels, Sanidate had a really wide range. I think it was five something parts per million to 1800 um, parts per million of, of Sanidate 5.0. Um, so I usually recommend sticking within that range and that allows a little bit of buffer for, you know, if you're, if you're improperly measuring or if you're, um, you know, off gassing. But I will also say that, um, I will also say that one of the methods I shared, one of the resources I shared about dosing has a lot of suggestions on ways to, instead of like eyeballing measurements on um, spigots that you can use that you can very quickly measure things. Um, so I guess I would also opt as you refine your system, try to key on, on ways that you're not eyeballing as much. So you're either measuring, I, I know people that use like a tea, literally they have their sanitizer teaspoon that is labeled. Um, 
but but that's kind of what my recommendation would be. Okay, for recirculation system, any recommendation for cleaning the inside of plumbing, um, the rinse conveyor? Oh, I, I'm not from, I've heard this name before. I'm not familiar with this specific conveyor. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the recommendations for managing the inside of plumbing is to use a low level of sanitizer, is, is to run that through. And one of the recommendations that we, one of the reasons we recommend using a sanitizer, even on single pass water, um, that's not going to be recirculated or not going through batch, is it will minimize the buildup of biofilms. And over time, it'll help you um, uh, manage your, your um, system a little bit easier. I am not, but I'm not particularly familiar with this risk, rinse conveyor. So if anybody else on the call has specific recommendation, I'm the floor is yours. And there is a chat, a comment in the chat box. I'm assuming you'll share your slides, the recording, and the oh, the Excel tool. Um, yes, and Meredith said yes. Any other questions? Well, as you think of questions, how about I have, um, I wanna share my resources slide with you. So let me share screen again. Um, I do very quickly want to highlight for anybody in the audience who is going to be uh, subject to the FISMA produce safety rule, or if you're a covered farm, um, I do want to highlight that the compliance dates for harvest and post-harvest ag water are right around the corner. Um, so these enforcement dates are, um, are separated by business size. So for that largest farm category, all other businesses, so these are uh, total produce sales greater than $500,000. Those enforcement dates are going to be next month, so January 26, 2023, and then they are staggered down from there. So small businesses, you have an extra year, very small businesses to 2025. So just really want to highlight that because those compliance dates are right around the corner. And with that, I do want to share this resource list. Um, I, and I also want to acknowledge my colleague, Don Steckel. He had some input on my labeling slides. We have a lot of sanitizer discussions together. Um, but that here's the resource list. In theory, my QR code should work. So if you open your camera app and point it to the screen, it should open the um, this Google Doc with the resource list for you. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Jennifer. It, it does work. I had, to, I had to go through a couple iterations. And for anybody who is not a QR code user, oops, um, let me, oh, thank you, Michael. Michael also dropped the link into the chat box. Um, and that is just a Google Doc I put together with the resources that I referenced today. Um, that resource that I couldn't find about specific materials, I can actually, the, the nice thing about a Google Doc is I can add resources. So um, once I find it, I will drop that resource in the list as well at the bottom. And um, does anybody else need me to, hold, to keep showing the QR code? Because if not, I do wanna highlight the PSA website. Um, some of the PSA specific website or resources I shared with you are on the our PSA website. We also have this website in Spanish. Uh, if you yourself or you work with any Spanish speakers or Spanish speaking growers. And I also wanted to show my contact information here at the bottom. If you have any follow up questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks for so, sharing that, Donna. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to stop sharing and see if there's any last minute questions. I know we're at the one o'clock hour. All right, seems quiet. So Michael, do you mind putting up the next poll question for me? There's two and I'm I'm not. All right, here we go. I wanted to see it before, <laughs> before we started talking about what one it is. So this question asks, do you anticipate 
using at least one sanitizer tool that was discussed here today. So you could do yes, no, or maybe. And answering these poll questions is really important because we're able to bring in speakers like Donna, thanks to our grant funding. And because we have grant funding, we've got to turn around and tell them what we did and uh, try to show some impact that, that we've had. So we, we appreciate you um, answering some questions. All right, so we'll end that one. And Michael, can you put up the next one, please? So this one is asking, where do you stand now in terms of your knowledge about choosing and using sanitizers in post-harvest? So you answered um, at the beginning of the session. And so now, where do you stand? Hopefully you feel a little bit more confident. And we will um, get the recording out to everyone and, and links to the, to the resources also. And please feel free to share this information with others. Um, it's also could be a great presentation for someone, maybe you've got an employee who handles sanitation and post-harvest. This would be a great training for them to listen in um, on and make them a little bit more educated about the work they do at the farm. Or maybe you've heard another farmer complaining about, about these topics and this could be useful to them. So you'd have the link and be able to share that via email in the future, so. All right. Yes, son, it is a complicated topic. And it's always changing, right? And and every situation on every farm is is different. That's <laughs> why so it's so nice to get out onto farms and have these conversations, right? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Donna. This was a great presentation. And I know we're on our end going to use it again in the future. We'll share the link with you too uh, once once we have it up on our, our YouTube channel. And thank you all for, for joining us for this presentation. And um, we appreciate that Donna is willing to, to follow up with any questions that you have. And that goes for the same with the Rutgers on Farm Food Safety team. So thank you. And uh, we'll see everyone in the, in the new year. Bye, everybody. Thank you both. Appreciate it. See ya.